website, cspan.org. Here on C-SPAN 2, we're live at the Rayburn House office building, awaiting the start of the first of two days of hearings on the use of steroids, performance-enhancing drugs in baseball. This is the House Oversight Committee. Witnesses today include former Senator George Mitchell, who uh, headed the report, headed the investigation. Also, players representative Don Fear and baseball commissioner Bud Selig. Committee will come to order. When our committee held its first hearing three years ago on Major League Baseball's steroid scandal, I talked about how the culture of Major League clubhouses trickled down to become the culture of the high school gym. Later that same day, Dan Hooten and Denise and Raymond Garibaldi proved that connection with their powerful testimony about the deadly impact that steroids had on their sons. The Hooten and Garibaldi families were frustrated that baseball wasn't doing more to confront its role in a growing epidemic. For our part, this committee made it clear to the players and owners that they needed to take steps and major ones to deal with this problem. The first was to dramatically strengthen the league's testing program for performance enhancing drugs. The second was to investigate the extent of steroid use. The starting point for addressing any scandal is in the facts. If a cheating scandal broke out at any university, the bare minimum we would expect is a thorough review of what happened and how it happened. This, unfortunately, wasn't baseball's first impulse. The commissioner, the owners, and the union didn't want to look at the past. The code of silence in baseball clubhouses was threatening to become baseball's official policy. To his credit, Commissioner Selig listened to the testimony at our hearing and recognized that baseball had a serious problem. He then did the right thing and ask Senator George Mitchell to take a hard look at baseball's steroid era. I thank Commissioner Selig for that, and I thank Senator Mitchell for taking on an enormous task. 
Anyone who reads the Mitchell Report will come to understand how difficult this challenge was. Virtually no one volunteered information to Senator Mitchell. In fact, only one active player, Frank Thomas, agreed to speak with his investigators. Senator Mitchell and his staff did a superb job, but I think even they would acknowledge that their report isn't a comprehensive accounting of the steroid scandal. If reports had epitaphs, this one would be, it didn't tell us everything, but it told us enough. And what it tells us is damning. The illegal use of steroids and performance enhancing drugs was pervasive for more than a decade. Major League Baseball was slow and ineffective in responding to the scandal, and the use of human growth hormone has been rising. The Mitchell Report also makes it clear that everyone in baseball is responsible, the owners, the commissioner, the union, and the players. Despite that shared responsibility, most of the media attention over the past month has focused on the players. They are the face of the game, and they are the ones our kids emulate. As Chuck Kimmel, the president of the National Athletic Trainers Association, recently pointed out, young athletes are very impressed by what their sports heroes say and do. There's a real authority carryover in these situations. They assume because a person is an expert in one area that they're qualified in another. Our committee hasn't had an easy experience with individual players. We've tried to be sensitive to their legitimate privacy rights and to the obvious harm this issue can do to their reputations. But too often their responses to legitimate questions have been evasive or incomplete. This investigation is no different than any other that we undertake. We expect, and the law requires, truthful testimony. In one important instance, the Mitchell Report provides new information to re relating to one of our previous inquiries. Three years ago, we initiated an investigation into testimony that Rafael Palmero provided on March 17, 2005. Mr. Palmero testified that he never took steroids. Several months later, he's tested positive for Winstrol, a powerful steroid. As part of that investigation, we interviewed Miguel Tejada for relevant information. A transcript of that interview has never been made public out of respect for Mr. Tejada's, uh, Tejada's uh, privacy. But in that interview, Mr. Tejada told the committee that he never used illegal performance enhancing drugs and he had no knowledge of other players using or even taking or talking about steroids. Well, the Mitchell Report, however, directly contradicts key elements of Mr. Tejada's testimony. The conflict is stark and fundamental to the committee's 2005 investigation. As a result, Ranking Member Tom Davis and I will be writing the Department of Justice today to request an, into, an investigation into whether Mr. Tejada gave truthful answers to the committee. I also want to make it clear that the steroid scandal is not just about ball players. In my view, not enough attention has been paid to the Mitchell Report's indictment of the people who run baseball. The players seem to have been surrounded by enablers and officials willing to look the other way. In the end, the owners and the commissioner's office are every bit at fault as the players. The report recounts how the medical director for Major League Baseball actually led a presentation in 1998 on the benefits that could be obtained from testosterone. Team doctors who attended the meeting were disturbed the league's medical office seemed to be sending an official message of leniency. The situation in the league's security office didn't, didn't uh, seem to be much better. Little investigating seems to have been done when reports of illegal steroid use were passed along. In a steroids case involving former 
Cleveland Indian outfielder Juan Gonzalez, the league's security office appears to have done nothing. In another case, a bullpen catcher for the Montreal Expos, Luis Perez and Kevin Hallinan, uh, the director of security for Major League Baseball, a list of eight players who had obtained anabolic steroids. And I want to read from the Mitchell Report about what happened next. Quote, Hallinan told us that Perez's incident could have been the single most important steroids investigation he conducted. But to his disappointment, he was not given permission to interview the Major League players named by Perez. The Mitchell Report also recounts the efforts of Stan Conti, the chief trainer for the San Francisco Giants, to remove Greg Anderson from the Giants clubhouse. Mr. Anderson was Barry Bonds' personal trainer. The different approaches taken by Mr. Conti, the Giants general manager, Brian Sabian, and the Giants president, P Peter McGowan, are a sad reflection of the poor leadership many teams brought to this effort. In a dismal record, and it needs to be put front and it, it is a dismal record, and it needs to be put front and center, not hidden. It helps us understand how the steroids era infected baseball and how that virus spread to colleges and high school. That's the bad news. The good news is that I believe baseball is now taking steroids use seriously and making fundamental changes. In 2005, Commissioner Selig and Don Fear, the head of the Players Union, voluntarily reopened bargaining. To their credit, they worked together to make baseball's steroids policy one of the toughest in sports. I might say that in 2005, I had my doubts at whether Mr. Selig and Mr. Fear would rise to this occasion, but I want to commend them both for the leadership that they have been showing. And in the wake of the Mitchell report, Mr. Fear accepted responsibility and said, quote, in retrospect, we should have done something sooner. Since the report's release, Commissioner Selig has begun implementing some of the Mitchell recommendations, and both the owners and the players have agreed to try to reach agreement on additional changes. This committee wants Major League Baseball to have the most effective program possible. We also want to do everything we can to eliminate the use of these drugs by children. Frank and Brenda Marrero, and the parents of Efrain Marrero, are here this morning, uh, along with Don Hooten. Efrain Marrero was a promising 19-year-old college athlete who turned to steroids and ultimately committed suicide. In his memory, Mr. and Mrs. Marrero have established a foundation to fight steroids and other performance-enhancing drugs. They have also submitted testimony for this hearing, and I ask unanimous consent that it be made part of the record. Without objection, that will be the order. I want to close my opening statement by reading from their statement. Simple, honest accountability is all we are asking for, no family should have to endure this anguish we've suffered, but tens of thousands of youngsters are at risk. For them, we ask you to dig deep, find the unvarnished truth, and report it unfairly." End quote. To Mr. and Mrs. Marrero, Mr. Hooten, and to all the concerned parents around our nation, I want you to know we are trying to do just that. I want to now recognize uh, Mr. Davis, who as chairman of this committee held that important uh, hearing and investigation got us started. It's an effort that we've worked closely together on, and I'm pleased to continue that, uh, that uh, role with him uh, in, in well, this year's uh, hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would associate myself with your opening statement. I want to note that we, too, have reviewed Mr. Tejada's uh, statement to the committee and the evidence regarding him in the Mitchell Report. And as a result of that review, we've concluded that further investigation is warranted into, into whether Mr. Tejada made knowingly false material statements to the committee. Therefore, we will join the Chairman in asking the Justice Department to investigate this matter. Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling this hearing. In the words of baseball's dugout philosopher Yogi Berra, this is deja vu all over again. The game of baseball, its fans and aspiring players seem caught in the grip of a recurring drug-induced nightmare. Let's be clear about our purpose. 
We're not self-appointed prosecutors trying the claims of the Mitchell report. This is not a court of law, and the guilt or innocence of the players accused in the report of steroid abuse is not our major concern. Our focus is on Senator Mitchell's recommendations more than his findings. We're here to save lives, not ruin careers. We want steroids and other dangerous drugs out of sports, period. We want this because we know those who aspire to athletic stardom look up to those who have achieved it and often emulate their methods. We want young athletes to understand there are no shortcuts to success, that excellence has to be the product of physical exertion, not pharmacology. In true sport, the road to achievement is paved with hard work, dedication, and focus, not the cream, the clear, or human growth hormone. We know some consider this exercise a waste of time. They say sports are none of our business and we ought to be sticking to what's important, winning the war on terror, strengthening homeland security, reviving a flogging economy. Some even throw a sports metaphor back at us and claim we're only grandstanding. Us, playing to the crowd, perish the thought. But seriously, to those critics I say, other issues might be more important, but that doesn't make this inquiry unimportant. There's nothing irrelevant or inconsequential about the health of our children and the integrity of the game so many of us love. I would hope no one would dispute that protecting public health, keeping young athletes safe, is a vital and appropriate function of government. Nearly three years ago, our first foray into this subject proved ext extremely productive. After our hearings, then Ranking Member Henry Waxman and I introduced legislation that turned out to be unnecessary because baseball and other major sports acted quickly on their own to enhance drug testing and enforcement programs. A little governmental sunshine can go a long way. Today, thanks to the leadership of Commissioner Selig and the wise willingness of Union Chief Don Fair to urge cooperation among his members, baseball now doles out 50 game suspensions for first offenses. 100 game suspensions for second offenses and lifetime bans for third offenses. All players are tested twice a year and testing techniques have been improved to detect more substances at lesser levels. Baseball also has targeted abuse of amphetamines, which in many clubhouses were literally dumped into a coffee pot for communal consumption. Now we have before us the Mitchell Report. Its 409 pages paint a sordid picture of backroom drug deals involving clubhouse personnel, players injecting each other with illegal substances right in their locker rooms, and more efforts aimed at obfuscation than confiscation. The report names 89 players with varying degrees of involvement with steroids in HGH, but they are just part of a far wider culture within the sport that values home runs and victories over fair play. The report confirms that active participation or passive acquiescence in drugging cannot coexist with the responsibility to set a proper example for those stepping up the lower rungs of the ladder of athletic success. In other words, while two years ago we hoped otherwise, our work here is definitely not done. Stiffer penalties and stepped up enforcement have caused some players to back off of steroid use. Unfortunately, that progress has created a strong perverse incentive to develop substances that can't be detected by current testing regimes. But as a panelist in our last baseball hearing famously said, we're not here to talk about the past. Our panel today will address, in essence, one question. Going forward, what will the leaders of baseball do to implement the recommendations outlined in this report? We'll ask Senator Mitchell how these specific recommendations came to be, what makes them particularly important given what the Mitchell panel found. We're watching closely because America's youth are watching closely. Despite significant efforts, including the Atlas and Athena programs that discourage steroid use among high schoolers, <coughs> attitudes about steroids and usage levels among young athletes have remained stubbornly constant. Not surprisingly, rates of steroid use go up as the athletic stakes get higher. Steroid abuse by high school seniors seeking that extra edge to earn a college scholarship is twice that of eighth graders, where the goal is merely to catch the eye of a high school coach. Over the past five years, more teens have come to believe steroids are dangerous, but the percentage of those who actually disapprove of performance-enhancing drugs remains sadly unchanged. The myth of youthful invulnerability, the allure of athletic success, and the rationale that everyone else is doing it combined to drive an intoxicating culture that won't be countered effectively with slogans, posters, and half-hearted enforcement programs. 
We commend Commissioner Selig for having the courage to appoint Senator Mitchell to undertake this investigation and for letting his findings become public. They certainly did not reflect well on the Commissioner's sport or his tenure as its leader, but he let the chips fall where they may. Let us applaud him for finally attacking the problem rather than running and hiding from it. Already the Commissioner has ordered all recommendations that he believes did not require union approval to be implemented immediately. This means drug tests and background checks for clubhouse personnel. It means clubs will maintain a log of all packages sent to Major League ballparks, that they will distribute and post Major League Baseball's policy on prohibited substances. Perhaps most significantly, it means a 24-hour notice of steroid testing will be eliminated. These are encouraging first steps, but they are all they are, first steps. We also commend Mr. Fair for standing ready to discuss further amendments to the collective bargaining agreement. He leads a union that too often has been, frankly, intransigent and uncooperative. We know some of the measures suggested in the report, for example, that baseball should hire an independent firm to conduct testing, will not be easy to sell. But he has helped his members see the writing on the wall, which says this, baseball needs to fix the problem, change this culture, alter how it does business with regards to steroids, human growth hormone and all matter of dangerous performance enhancing drugs, or, and this is a promise, not a threat, Congress will do it for you. Finally, we just commend Senator Mitchell for his excellent work, saddled with a daunting list of obstacles, no subpoena power, no cooperation from the players, and little enthusiasm among owners more concerned about keeping turnstiles clicking and home runs flying. He produced a sober, even-handed document whose factual assertions almost universally have stood up to scrutiny. Senator Mitchell's recommendations at first glance seem well-grounded and realistic, and we will have the chance to probe them further today. For example, he urges the Commissioner to establish an office with enhanced authority to investigate and report the use of performance-enhancing drugs. Major League Baseball already responded last week, announcing creation of a new Department of Investigations. The recommendations and actions appear to be sound, but I understand the Union Chief believes the devil will be in the details. How will the new office's powers be? How will it work uh, with the players to accomplish its goal? Has baseball effectively reorganized itself into setting up this office, or has the sport simply reshuffled the deck chairs in response to a scandal, like we often do in Congress? Senator Mitchell also calls for increasing player education about the dangers of steroid use. Former big league manager Phil Garner told the story of confronting one of his players about steroid use and telling him his heart could give out by the age of 40. The player said he didn't care, that he wanted to be as big and strong and rich now as possible. He would worry about the rest later. And finally, Senator Mitchell recommends increasing independence and transparency of the program as well as conducting year-round unannounced testing. Mr. Fair, I suspect you have your work cut out for you to convince players to embrace these recommendations. But the collective bargaining process shouldn't be used as an excuse to tolerate or shield illegal activities, activities which degrade and damage the very enterprise that employs the players. Negotiation is the right process, but we can't abide in action or half measures as its only products. The health of young athletes across the country is at stake, and we won't hesitate to defend their interests or their interests of millions of Americans who have grown tired of the cloud that is still hovering over baseball. From this moment, we begin to look into steroids in sports and, uh, from, uh, and, and how their use affects impressionable young athletes. Our efforts from this issue have been bipartisan. <coughs> from the beginning, our committee has come together in a sense of cooperation and teamwork that continues to this day. In that spirit, we look forward to a frank and constructive discussion today on how to clean up baseball. When commentators talk about the importance of chemistry in the locker room, that is not what they had in mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis. I, uh, I, I also want to commend Senator Mitchell for the uh, terrific work he has done on this report. Uh, Senator Mitchell, you have an outstanding record as a member of the Senate and the leader of the Senate. And I could go through your many accomplishments, but you may have achieved even more uh, since you left the Senate as an international statesman. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you're well known for your, your work in bringing divided uh, groups together. You brought people together in Northern Ireland. You brought Democrats and Republicans together on this committee, and I thank you for that. Uh, you uh, have done a, a great job, and I know how difficult it is to uh, do a job without subpoena power uh, when we were in the minority, but we have worked together in this committee to, uh, 
to uh, use what powers we have to accomplish the important things that uh, need to be accomplished. So I thank you for your work and I am pleased you are here. I am also mindful of your time schedule. I do want to inform you that it's the, it's the policy of this committee, no matter who testifies, that they testify under oath. So if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Well, I want to recognize you to uh, make your presentation right. to us. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Davis, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to appear before you this morning. In March 2006, I was asked by the Commissioner of Baseball to conduct an independent investigation into the illegal use of steroids and other performance-enhancing substances in Major League Baseball. When he asked me to accept this responsibility, the Commissioner promised that I would have total independence and his full support. He kept that promise. Last month, I completed and made public my report. Since then, the public discussion has largely focused on the names of players who are identified in the report. I will focus today on the report's broader findings and recommendations. I begin with a summary of our conclusions. The illegal use of steroids, human growth hormone, and other performance enhancing substances by well-known athletes may cause serious harm to the user. In addition, their use encourages young people to use them. Because adolescents are already subject to significant hormonal changes, the abuse of steroids and other such substances can have more serious adverse effects on them than on adults. Many young Americans are placing themselves at serious risk. Some estimates appear to show a recent decline in steroid use by high school students. That's heartening. But the most recent range of estimates is from about 2 percent to 6 percent. Even the lower figure means that hundreds of thousands of high school aged young people are illegally using steroids. It's important to deal with well-known athletes who are illegal users. But it's at least as important, perhaps even more so, to be concerned about the reality that hundreds of thousands of our children are using these substances. Every American, not just baseball fans, ought to be shocked by that disturbing truth. During the period discussed in my report, the use of steroids in Major League Baseball was widespread in violation of federal law and of baseball policy. Club officials routinely discussed the possibility of substance use when evaluating players. The response by baseball was slow to develop and was initially ineffective. The Players Association had for many years opposed a mandatory random drug testing program, but they agreed to the adoption of such a program in 2002, after which the response gained momentum. Since then, the Major League Clubs and the Players Association have agreed to a number of improvements to the program, including stronger penalties that have increased its effectiveness. The current program has been effective in that detectable steroid use appears to have declined. However, many players have shifted to human growth hormone, which is not detectable in any currently available urine test. The minority of players who used these substances were wrong. They violated federal law and baseball policy, and they distorted the fairness of competition by trying to gain an unfair advantage over the majority of players who followed the law and the rules. They, the players who follow the law and play by the rules, are faced with the painful choice of either being placed at a competitive disadvantage or becoming illegal users themselves. No one should have to make that choice. Obviously, the players who illegally used performance-enhancing substances 
are responsible for their actions. But they did not act in a vacuum. Everyone involved in baseball over the past two decades, commissioners, club officials, the Players Association, and players, shares to some extent in the responsibility for the steroids era. There was a collective failure to recognize the problem as it emerged and to deal with it early on. As a result, an environment developed in which illegal use became widespread. Knowledge and understanding of the past are essential if the problem is to be dealt with effectively in the future. But being chained to the past is not helpful. Baseball does not need and cannot afford to engage in a, ne a never-ending search for the name of every player who ever used performance-enhancing substances. In my report, I acknowledged and even emphasized the obvious. There is much about the illegal use of performance-enhancing substances in baseball that I did not learn. There were and there are other suppliers and other users, and it is clear that a number of players have obtained these substances through so-called rejuvenation centers using prescriptions of doubtful validity. Other investigations will no doubt turn up more names and fill in more details, but that is unlikely to significantly alter the description of baseball steroids era as set forth in my report. The commissioner was right to ask for this investigation and this report. It would have been impossible to get closure on this issue without it or something like it. It's appropriate to acknowledge, Mr. Chairman, that it was you and this committee who originally suggested that such an inquiry be conducted. But it's now time to look to the future, to get on with the important and difficult task that lies ahead. I urge everyone involved in Major League Baseball to join in a well-planned, well-executed, and sustained effort to bring the era of steroids and human growth hormone to an end and to prevent its recurrence in some other form in the future. That's the only way this cloud will be removed from the game. The adoption of the recommendations set forth in my report will be a first step in that direction, and I will now summarize them. While some can be and have been implemented by the Commissioner unilaterally, Others are subject to collective bargaining and therefore will require the agreement of the Players Association. The recommendations focus on three areas. First, there must be an enhanced capacity to conduct investigations based on non-testing evidence. Some illegal substances are difficult or virtually impossible to detect. Indeed, one leading expert has argued that testing only scratches the surface. The ability to investigate vigorously allegations of violations is an essential part of any meaningful drug prevention program. The Commissioner has accepted my recommendation to create a Department of Investigations led by a senior executive to respond promptly and aggressively to allegations of the illegal use or possession of performance enhancing substances. To do its job effectively, this department must establish credibility and cooperate closely with law enforcement agencies. I recommended that the Commissioner strengthen pre-existing efforts to keep illegal substances out of Major League Baseball clubhouses by logging and tracking packages shipped to players at Major League ballparks, conducting background checks and random drug tests on clubhouse employees, and adopting policies to ensure that allegations of a player's possession or use of performance enhancing substances <clears throat> are reported promptly to the Department of Investigations. I also recommended that club personnel with responsibility affecting baseball operations be required to sign annual certifications that they have no unreported knowledge of any possible violation of Major League Baseball's drug prevention policy. The Commissioner has implemented all of these recommendations. Second, improved educational programs about the dangers of substance use are critical to any effort to deter use. Over the last several years, the Commissioner's Office and the Players Association 
have made an increased effort to provide players and club personnel with educational materials on performance enhancing substances. Some of these efforts have been effective. Some were criticized by both former players and club personnel. Several suggestions for improvement are set forth in my report. Third, although it is clear that even the best drug testing program is by itself not sufficient, drug testing remains an important element of a comprehensive approach to combat illegal use. The current program was agreed to in 2000 and will remain in effect until 2011. Any changes to the program, therefore, must be negotiated and agreed to by the clubs and the Players Association. In my report, I set forth the principles that presently characterize a state-of-the-art drug testing program, and I urge the clubs and the Players Association to incorporate them into baseball's program when they next deal with this issue. The program should be administered by a truly independent authority that holds exclusive authority over its structure and administration. It should be transparent to the public, allowing for periodic audits of its operations and providing regular reports of aggregate data on testing and test results. It should include adequate year-round unannounced testing and employ best practices as they develop. To ensure that the independent administrator can accomplish these objectives, the program should receive sufficient funding. And it should continue to respect the legitimate privacy and due process rights of the players. Finally, I hope that the Commissioner, the clubs, and the Players Association will have a reasonable time and opportunity to consider and discuss these recommendations with their members and constituents and to reach their own conclusions about their implementation. My report demonstrates that I'm not an apologist for either the Commissioner or the Players Association. But in fairness, I think, I think we should recognize what they have done to address this problem. As noted in my report, prior to the 2002 negotiations, the Commissioner took, took several key steps to lay the foundation for an agreement on a mandatory random drug testing program, including in early 2001, he convened a meeting of several respected team physicians during which they shared their own experiences and concerns about the use of steroids by major league players. That year, he unilaterally imposed a drug testing program for minor league players, which he could do because minor league players are not represented by the Players Association. In 2002, after detailed negotiations, the Players Association agreed to the Commissioner's proposal for a mandatory random testing program in the major leagues. To their credit, this was a significant step by the Players Association because, as I noted earlier, they had for many years opposed such a program. The drug testing programs in all sports, including the Olympics, have evolved over time through a process of trial and error as the programs were modified to address emerging problems and concerns. In that respect, baseball's program has been like all the others. As described in my report, since 2002, the Commissioner and the Players Association have agreed to several improvements in the program to deal with issues as they arose. They did so even though under federal labor law, they were under no obligation to modify their collectively bargained agreement during its term. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I was asked to conduct an inquiry and to report what I found as accurately, as fairly, and as thoroughly as I could. I've done so to the best of my ability, and my work has been completed. Now it's up to the commissioner, the clubs, and the players to decide how they will proceed. Their actions over the past six years have demonstrated that they can address this problem through the collective bargaining process. I hope you will encourage and give them the opportunity to do so again. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to be here and for your patience, and I'll be pleased now to try to respond to any questions 
that you or any other member of the committee may have. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Mitchell. We'll now uh, proceed to recognize members for five minutes for uh, questions for the, uh, for the Senator. We'll start with Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and, of course, uh, Ranking Member Davis as well. Um, Senator Mitchell, thank you so much for your job well done. At the hearing in 2005, I asked the players whether anyone who had knowledge of steroids use should be required to report it. And by anyone, I mean trainers, team doctors, scouts, agents, clubhouse staff, management, everyone officially connected with the game. Some players said yes, some said no. Senator Mitchell, your report found that a lot of people in and out of baseball knew about steroid use and either turned a blind eye or actively concealed it or I don't want to get involved concept. What should the consequences be for the people who enabled the players to cheat and had baseball done enough dealing with that problem? Right. Uh, thank you, Congressman. In my report, I noted that for many years, baseball has had a policy requiring the disclosure of information about the use of performance enhancing substances and making possible severe penalties in the form of fines for those who fail to comply with that policy. We found, however, that very large numbers of persons involved in baseball were unaware of the policy, and even many who were aware did not follow it. We also found that no one has ever been fined for failure to comply with that policy. As a consequence, included as part of our recommendations, uh, uh, and they're found in the report, we suggest that there be a written policy at the major league level, MLB level, which is distributed to all of the clubs, setting forth the process to be followed when information is available that should be reported, and also that every club should have a policy widely distributed, posted, and made known to all employees about the process to be followed when such information is available and should be reported. Uh, I, I should point out, however, that there are some ethical questions regarding physicians and other medical personnel in terms of legal requirements uh, imposing restraints on the provision of information. And of course, every state has such laws and they must be observed. With that in mind, we think the policy can be much more clearly articulated and can be much more aggressively disseminated and pursued and failures to comply with the policy should receive discipline or punishment pursuant to the policy. Right. Very quickly, I see the, uh, the light is uh, about to change on me. How would you characterize uh, the level of cooperation you receive from the Players Association while conducting your investigation? Uh, as I said in my report, the Players Association was largely uncooperative. You know, I'm concerned about uh, that because, uh, you know, I remember when uh, football uh, we had some problems, and of course, uh, they need to uh, understand that this is very serious. Uh, they are role models, even though some say they're not. But I think when young people look at them and uh, uh, they uh, see them as role models, and I think they have to understand that, and we have obligation and responsibility. Yeah. Very quickly, just before uh, uh, the light change on me, when we had hearings on baseball a few years ago, one of the things we found was that Major League Baseball was sweeping the, the problem of steroid use under the rug. Other sports, like football, had a serious steroid problem in the past, but had really taken steps to clean up the game. Senator Mitchell, how would you compare Major League Baseball today to the other sports leagues, like the 
in CAA and the Olympic sports in terms of how credible, effective the drug program is? Uh, in my uh, report, I included uh, an analysis of the known provisions of all other programs, uh, uh, a point-by-point -point comparison. Uh, it is clear that in terms of penalties, uh, Major League Baseball has the strongest program. The penalties are the stiffest when measured in proportion to the length of season and uh, other indicia. Uh, with respect to the operations of the program, uh, we did not have access uh, to the other programs other than that which has been publicly described about them. And I caution anyone in attempting to make comparisons based solely on the, uh, on the published data about the programs. It really does require a detailed analysis and in-depth knowledge of the actual manner in which the programs are operated to be able to conduct uh, the kind of comparison which I think you're seeking. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Mr. Yeah. Davis. Senator Mitchell, again, thank you for yep. your report. And uh, let, let me start. There seems to be some disagreement between the Players Association and you regarding the opportunity for a player to respond right. uh, to the evidence against him. Most of this disagreement appears to be over how and what was communicated to the, to the players prior to October 22nd, 2007. We have a letter from you on that date stating that during the course of any interview, I will inform the player of the evidence of his use, including permitting him to examine and answer questions about copies of any relevant checks, mailing receipts, or other documents, and give him an opportunity to respond. The Players Association responded in a November 20th letter that the players had been informed that you would provide them with the evidence if they consented to the interview. Your letter talks about an opportunity to respond. The Players Association talks about being provided with evidence if they consented to an interview. I guess my question is, was a player required to consent to an interview to see the evidence against them? Yes. Okay. Uh, he, so he, they couldn't simply appear, review the evidence, and leave if they concluded they had nothing to say about the evidence? That's correct. Okay. Do you have any earlier letters communicating your offer to provide the evidence to the players? Yes. Could the decision of players not to come in have been the result of their belief that they would be required to answer questions? I can't speak for the players. I did not communicate with any current players directly. And if I might, I'll be glad to give a more detailed explanation, Congressman Davis, when you complete your question. Well, go ahead. why don't you go right. ahead? Because well, it's important. Uh, from the first day of this investigation to the last, I was consistent in my public statements that players would have the opportunity to meet with me. And at that time, I would disclose to them all of the evidence that I had and give them an opportunity to respond. On March 30, 2006, the day I publicly accepted this assignment, I said, I quote, we will provide those whose reputations have been or might be called into question by these allegations an opportunity to be heard. On January 18, 2007, I addressed the owners in Phoenix and my re remarks were made public and widely reported throughout the country. I said I will insist that those who might be adversely affected by this investigation have an opportunity to be heard. I made similar statements in press interviews during the spring and summer of 2007 and I will be glad to provide you uh, with references to those statements. We were informed early in the process by Major League Baseball officials that we were bound by the provisions of the collective bargaining agreement between Major League Baseball and the Players Association, which require that requests for interviews with current players be made through the Players Association. As a result, in the summer and fall of 2007, I sent a series of letters to the Players Association listing the names of those players we sought to interview because we had received allegations that they had used performance enhancing substances. We identified the years during which the alleged use had occurred and the clubs with which the players were then affiliated. The Players Association subsequently responded in letters stating that all of the players declined to be interviewed. In October 2007, in a personal meeting that I had with representatives of the Players Association, we were informed that they had not previously understood 
that any player who participated in an interview would, at that interview, be informed of the allegations that we had received about him. So to make absolutely certain that there could not possibly be any further misunderstanding, I asked them to again contact all of the players involved and inform them of the details of my offer. I followed that up with a letter in which I reiterated that, and I quote, to be clear, I have been and remain willing to meet with any player about whom allegations of performance enhancing substance use have been made in order to provide those players with an opportunity to respond to those allegations. During the course of any such interview, I will inform the players of the evidence of their use, including permitting him to examine and answer questions about copies of any relevant checks, mailing receipts or other documents, and give him an opportunity to respond. Five weeks later, the Players Association responded in a letter on behalf of those players, which the letter stated in part that some have been in direct contact with you. On behalf of the others, we report that they continue to respectfully decline your request. And those that had been in contact with us declined the request through other lawyers, almost without exception. Thus, according to the Players Association, all of the current players about whom allegations were received were contacted twice once in the summer and early fall of 2007, and then between October and November of 2007, and each time they declined my invitation to meet and talk with me. At your request, Mr. Chairman, I have supplied all of this correspondence to the committee. I should say just for the record, Congressman Davis, that a different procedure was followed for former players. They are not members of the bargaining unit that is represented by the Players Association. We contacted each former player directly, by telephone, by letter, or both, to inform them that allegations had been received about them and to invite them to an opportunity to an interview and to provide them with the chance to respond. Even though we were not required to do so, at the request of the Players Association, we provided to the Players Association a list of all the former players about whom allegations were received. Can I just ask, did any former or current players come forward and have their names cleared as a result of the invitation that you? Yes. One former player uh, retained a, his own lawyer who contacted us and asked to come in and meet with me. Uh, I met with him uh, and his lawyer. He told us that he had, in fact, purchased performance enhancing substances illegally, as had been alleged by Kirk Radomski, one of the witnesses who we interviewed. He told us, however, that he had not used them. I asked him whether he had any evidence to support or corroborate his statement. He said that he had, and he provided that evidence to us. We conducted an independent investigation uh, and concluded that he was telling the truth. Uh, and that we, therefore, made the decision not to include him in the report. Now, I, I'm not clear whether you're talking about no. current or former players. I asked both, and you just yeah. said it was a former yeah. player. Yeah. No current yeah. player came no, forward. I, 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 let me, yeah. I, I'm, I don't want to characterize the status of the player, if no, I might. That's fine. Right. Okay. Thank either, you. Either current or former. That, Thank you, Mr. Bravis. Mr. Cummings? Uh, Senator Mitchell, I want to, first of all, thank you for an outstanding uh, uh, report. I, and I have all, long, for a long time been a great admirer of yours. Your integrity and your, what you bring to public life is just incredible. Um, I want to just kind of refocus us a little bit. Uh, Senator Mitchell, this, this committee held hearings on this issue of steroid abuse in Major League Baseball in 2005. Uh, one of our most powerful witnesses at that hearing was Donald Hooten, the father of Taylor Hooten, a teenage uh, ball player who committed suicide after taking steroids. Mr. Hooten is in the uh, audience at this hearing. Frank and Brenda Marrero are also here today. Unfortunately, their son, too, Ephraim, 
also committed suicide after taking steroids in an effort to become a better athlete. I noticed that when you talked about your findings, the number two finding went to the whole issue of children and the fact that it could have the, the steroids uh, uh, and illegal substances could have an effect on, a very detrimental effect on children. Um, this committee, Senator, as you probably know, got a lot of flack back in 2005 uh, when we took a look at Major League Baseball and its handling of steroids. And, and we're receiving similar criticism even today. People say, why are you getting involved in that? But I want to take a moment to remind everyone why we are here in the first place. We're here, we started this because of our youngsters. We first uh, took a look at the issue of steroids upon learning of the deeply troubling uh, Centers of Disease Control Prevention uh, study that said one in 16 students reported using steroids. This was almost three times the amount who reported using steroids 10 years ago. Um, and I, I can tell you that steroids use is, as you said, is extremely dangerous. And I think, you know, as I listen to you, I'm, I'm, I want you to help us with this. You, you talked about ending the era of steroids. You also talked about the, how our children are affected. Your recommendations, I know, were going to the league, but I'm just wondering if, if the bottom line, see, I, I don't worry so much about the players because they're millionaires. Um, I worry about the kids who are impressionable, who are going to those uh, stores uh, on the weekend using their allowance to buy these substances. That's, that's what I worry about. I worry about the kids in my neighborhood whose only dream, they think the only dream they have is to become a major league athlete and buying this stuff. And so I guess what I'm asking is if we, and I want, we, we have a program say in Baltimore called Powered by Me. And what it does, it works with coaches and the clergy and so many others, parents to try to get parents to stay, get kids to stay off of steroids. Peter Angelos, the owner of the Orioles, who I'm glad is here, has agreed to be a major uh, part of that program. And I want to thank you, Peter. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, if we're going to end it, do you, are you looking at some kind of amnesty for these players so that perhaps they can then turn around and help our children? Or I mean, what did you have in mind? Uh, and these people who, you know, one of the, the dilemmas that we find ourselves in is that the people have committed a crime, as you said, uh, uh, gone against baseball policy at this critical moment, what message do we send if we were to grant some type of amnesty? Mm -hmm. And is the benefit uh, of stopping here and say, okay, you did it, you, we're going to put that aside, but we're going to go forward, is there, and, 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 you know, uh, is there a benefit to doing that? And how do you, what's your feeling about the, the way, if any, base, major baseball should help our children because the fact is is that a lot of damage, Senator, has already been done. It's already been done. There are kids right now who've got in their backpacks some of these very substances and they're going to be probably using them today, God forbid, but that's a fact. And it's based a lot upon uh, the folks that they were trying to emulate. And so I know that's a uh, packed question, but uh, if you try at it, please. I'm happy to do so, uh, Congressman. First, it is not a coincidence that I began my remarks with a reference to the dangers of steroid use by young people. <coughs> I believe that to be the most shocking fact that I uncovered in the course of this, uncovered in the sense of my knowledge. It was obviously known before, but it's not widespread. And I've tried hard in every public appearance I've made and will continue to do so to call attention to that fact. The fact that hundreds of thousands of American youngsters are using steroids ought to be a wake-up call to every American, whether they're sports fans or baseball fans or not. Secondly, let's be clear, this goes far beyond baseball, way, way beyond baseball. Baseball players are not the only persons who are role models for young people. All professional athletes are, entertainers are, political leaders are. Uh, it, it, it's a broad societal issue that, of which baseball is only a part. C could I answer the second part, Mr. Chairman, about because... Um, it's certainly welcome, Mr. Mitchell, but we do have many members and you're trying to get a, a train, but uh, right. go ahead and certainly yeah, give I, an answer. I just say, 
uh, respectfully, amnesty is a loaded word in American politics today. <laughs> uh, uh, what I said in my report was that I believe the Commissioner should forego discipline on past users except in those cases where he deems it necessary to impose discipline to protect the integrity of the game. My recommendation is based on several reasons. The first is that I believe that everyone involved should be trying to bring this troubling chapter in baseball's history to a close. The more time you spend in the past, the harder it is to look into the future. Secondly, the actions which I describe in my report are between two and nine years old. They are dated in time. It is a well-established principle of American labor law that if you impose discipline, it must be in accordance with the law that existed at the time the act occurred. In many of these instances, there was no punishment under the program or they even predated the program. Third, more than half of the people mentioned in my report are no longer in Major League Baseball and therefore the Commissioner has no authority to discipline them even if he wanted to do so. And finally, uh, and I, I have a fairly long section on this in the report, uh, uh, I, I, I want to just close with one thing. I spent five years working in Northern Ireland and after many long and painful negotiations and difficult decisions, a conflict that had raged for a long time was brought to an end. The most difficult, emotional and controversial part of the process that we adopted dealt with an analogous circumstance. The release from prison of persons who had been engaged in the struggle, who had committed what they believed were acts of patriotism but which the authorities and the victims and their families believed were brutal criminal acts. And I learned then that sometimes you have to turn the page and look to the future. And I sincerely believe, even as I recognize that there are valid arguments both ways, that baseball has got to look to the future. And the way to do that is to turn the page on the past, to lay the foundation for a well-conceived and well-executed program, and also a very strong discipline for future violations when everybody knows this is what we're going to do. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. Chairman. You. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Let me announce that uh, because of the time constraints, we won't recognize any members who have not come to the hearing up to this point to ask questions. And I'd like to ask each member to stay strictly within the five-minute time frame, even to anticipate that the answer may be part of the five minutes, not five minutes, and then a further five minutes for the answer itself. Uh, Mr. Burton, you're recognized at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's nice to see you again, Senator. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I would just like to start off by saying that uh, I hope every sport uh, and every commissioner of every sport and all the leaders of the sports will recognize that uh, this is a problem that's very pervasive. And uh, uh, I hope that they'll all uh, uh, take their lead from uh, baseball and uh, football and uh, start making sure that they stop steroid use and other drug use in their sports so that we don't have to have these kinds of hearings. I don't like to see Congress doing this. This doesn't seem to be something that I think Congress should be doing. Nevertheless, uh, I think it is useful, especially if it gets the message out to all sports figures and high profile figures that they should not be involved in this. I just have two questions for you, Senator, and then uh, I'll let my colleagues ask the rest of them. First of all, some of the sports uh, casters have asked, why did you uh, give the owners an advanced copy of the report and not give it to the Players Association? Right. No owner received an advanced copy of the report, Congressman. Uh -huh. uh, under the agreement I reached with the Commissioner at the outset, I provided to the Commissioner's office a copy of the report uh, because the Commissioner is legally bound to maintain confidentiality of certain information with respect to the drug testing program under the agreement between baseball and the Players Association. The Commissioner wanted, and I believe appropriately, 
to be able to review the report to make certain that I did not inadvertently disclose any information in violation of his legal obligation to maintain its confidentiality. Okay. He reviewed the, his uh, attorneys and others reviewed the report on that basis. There were no material changes in the report as a result. To the best of my knowledge, no owner saw the report, and certainly it was not my intention in complying with that agreement that the report go to the owners. Uh, along those same lines, uh, the chief investigator of uh, the Pete Rose, Pete Rose case, uh, John Dowd, said that uh, he was surprised that uh, there was a refusal by you and your, your staff uh, not to make public to the AP uh, and other news people right. uh, documents that were referenced in your footnotes. Uh, I'd just like to know uh, yes. what, what the response Certainly. is to that. We received and requested uh, a number of documents, uh, a total of 115,000 in all, in the course of the investigation from others for use in connection with the investigation. Our investigation is over, my work is completed, and the responsibility for the disclosure of those documents rests with the persons who are the owners and possessors of the document. And the, uh, those who seek them, we simply directed to the persons who own and possess the documents. Thank you, Senator. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Burton. Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, Thank you. Uh, for your report and for your time here today. Um, I understand, Senator, that one of the key features of any drug testing policy is the medical use exemption. And um, athletes who have a legitimate need for a particular banned substance or banned drug are allowed to apply for an exemption in order to use that. And baseball has that kind of a policy as well as I think the Olympics do. Right. That's an important exemption, but people are always concerned that it will be abused, obviously, that somebody is going to use that exemption as an excuse to uh, get their hands on a performance-enhancing drug. I understand that you attempted to obtain, in order to evaluate information on medical use exemptions, uh, that information from the Major League Testing Program, but didn't get it. Why did you ask for it? For the very reason stated in your question, uh, to attempt to satisfy ourselves that the uh, 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 program was being properly operated, there have been published reports involving other programs uh, uh, suggesting that the use of therapeutic use exemptions has been a mechanism to avoid <clears throat> the purposes of the program, and that's the reason we sought the information. Now, I understand that you weren't able to obtain them. You didn't have subpoena power, which uh, is that's remarkable correct. that you did such a thorough report without that, and I commend you for that. But uh, this committee did ask the, uh, the League for that information, and to their credit, they, they gave the information to the League. And interestingly enough, one of the largest number of players receiving exemptions were those that sought it for the treatment of attention deficit disorder. Uh, there were drugs like Ritalin and Adderall. And my understanding is that these are stimulants, similar to amphetamines. Uh, some athletes think that their performance enhances. Uh, they're listed by baseball as prohibited stimulants. Ritalin is classified as a, a Schedule II controlled substance. According to the Federal Drug Administration, these ADD drugs can cause sudden death, death, uh, stroke, heart attack, and adverse psychiatric effects. In 2006, ADD drugs were not a major issue. It appears that only 28 medical exemptions were granted. But in 2007, over 100 Major League Baseball players received medical use exemptions for these types of drugs. That's almost 8 percent of all players saying they had a medical use exemption for an ADD drug. This would appear to be an exceptionally high percentage, somewhat over 8 percent, or eight times, rather, the percentage of regular adults taking ADD medication in our population. I'd like to know what your reaction is to that. Uh, amphetamines were not part of our investigation. They were outside the mandate of our investigation, so I don't have any knowledge of, of uh, uh, the information that you've just provided. Well, I understand that. Uh, you weren't yeah. able to get the information, but... Uh, I, I would prefer not to comment until I saw the full details, uh, Congressman. I, I don't know anything other than what you've just stated, and since it was not part of our investigation, uh, uh, I, I don't have any comment at this time. Well, I appreciate that. And perhaps we'll save the, uh, the questions for the League and for the Players Association. I don't think we have enough information right now either on that, and we'll probably want to explore it more, but I think it's 
uh, it's certainly concerning uh, that you have that eight times the uh, adult population in our society using it in baseball, and so we'll explore that a little bit more with them. Thank you. Thank you. So, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Uh, Mr. Shays. Thank you, Senator, for your investigation. This is almost surreal to me. I um, first want to compliment uh, the chairman and ranking member for holding this hearing and for working so closely together. And they worked closely together when uh, now ranking member was the chairman. And I want to agree with uh, now ranking member Davis when he said this is not the most important issue facing the country, but it is still a very important issue. Um, what I wrestle with is, and why I feel this is surrealistic, is why should cheaters, uh, why should cheating be a matter of collective bargaining? In 1919, the Chicago Blackhawks scandal, you had eight players. You had a, a shortstop, two pitchers, two fielders, a first baseman, a utility man, a third base. When they tried to throw the uh, uh, Chicago White Sox playing Cincinnati Reds, and they were booted out for life. You didn't have a commissioner at the time. You had a commission because the American League and, and National League were formed in 03. So now we get a commissioner because of this scandal, and they took decisive action because of cheating. They didn't uh, do anything other than fire them, get rid of them, and send a huge message. So tell me why cheating should be a matter of collective bargaining. Uh, it has been settled law in the United States for more than 20 years that drug testing in the workplace is a subject of collective bargaining in those employer-employee situations where a recognized but bargaining isn't, isn't unit Isn't there exists. a difference? The purpose of these drugs is not to give pleasure. It's to give them an unbelievable advantage over the other players. It means they get to play and someone else doesn't get to play. Right. It means if you're a pitcher, uh, you have an advantage over the hitter. If you're a hitter, you have an advantage over the pitcher, and so on. This is cheating, isn't it? Uh, it is indeed. I've described it as such. Yeah. So but, but what I wrestle with is maybe the issue of, of uh, extracting blood and a testing process. But it doesn't seem to me that the penalty should be a matter of collective bargaining. It strikes me if you cheat, that supersedes the issue of drugs. It's an issue of cheating. So where I wrestle, what I wrestle with, and I'm wondering if you have the same uh, issue no. yourself. Don't you see a difference between someone taking a drug for pleasure and someone taking a drug so that they can cheat? Yes, I do, and I describe that in my report. There is a difference, and it's a significant difference, and taking a performance-enhancing substance to gain an unfair competitive advantage is a serious form of cheating in addition to being a violation of the law. I'll just say what the irony of this for me as well is, because of the Black Sox scandal, we establish a commissioner so that they would take, or he or she would take decisive action. And yet we have a circumstance where we banned steroids in 1991, but didn't have a testing process in 2003. And when we were asking in our hearing nearly three years ago uh, what the procedures were, they basically said they weren't in writing. Then we found out they were in writing, but they said it was a draft. And then when we got to see what was in writing, and it wasn't a draft, it was a suspension or a fine. So someone could pay a fine and you'd never know about it. Let me ask you about Mr. Palmieri. Was, uh, this case seems to describe to me a, a continued failure on the part of the commissioner and Major League Baseball to come to grips with this issue. Was he uh, found to have taken drugs before he hit his 300th hit? I'm sorry, before what? He had his 3,000th hit, Mr. Uh, Palmieri. Is this the case you're familiar with? I'm familiar with the case, but the the test uh, concluded that steroids were present in his system. I, I don't know whether a test can tell okay, precisely then, when the steroids. No, were this is the issue, and I'll, I'll, end, I'll end. I'll end with this because I can ask the the next panel. What I will want to ask the next panel is. Uh, when was he found to have taken the drug, 
the, ster uh, the, the, the drugs. Uh, was it before or after he had yeah. uh, concluded his 3,000th hit? Yeah. He was tested before. And found to, and it was a positive test. And, and it was a positive test. Yes. And Major League Baseball kept it quiet until he hit his 3,000th hit. Is that correct or not? Uh, that I don't I can, know. I mean, uh, he had his appeals. He had no, his appeals so I think that's procedure. a question for well, me. Well, let me quickly ask. Should yeah, the Mr. Shays, yeah, your, your time has expired and we're on a very tight schedule. Uh, Ms. Watson. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I want to thank the chair and the ranking member for your efforts uh, to thoroughly investigate the topic of illegal steroid and hormone abuse in Major League Baseball. I also want to commend Mr. Selleck because the Mitchell Report is an important tool for the MLB, especially for the reason that you, Senator Mitchell, conducted your investigation independently and released the report unedited by the Commissioner's Office or the Players' Union. And again, I want to caution that although comprehensive, the Mitchell Report is most exhausted, is not completely exhausted of the situation. So in an effort to take this to another level, I want to focus on the responsibility that major league sports groups, high profile athletes and the leaders in our society have to the general public. They must be held accountable to the message we send to other athletes, college students, impressionable high school young adults and small children, and people serving in the position of authority and leadership, and this includes sports personalities who young people seek to emulate in every way in our media-saturated society must always be critically aware of the consequences of their action and statements. Now, Major League Baseball does have well-intentioned programs in the field, and I want you to comment. I'll just make my statement, right. and whatever time we have left, uh, Senator, right. I would like you to comment. For example, uh, the Compton, California-based legacy of the late Congresswoman Juanita Millender McDonald, a dear friend and uh, a really uh, competent colleague. And uh, thanks to the partnership of Congresswoman Millender McDonald and Jimmy Lee Solomon, who's here, and Baseball Commissioner Bud Selleck, and Major League Baseball, um, excuse me, built its first baseball academy for urban minority children. There is nothing like it anywhere else in the country and on the campus of Compton Community College, the Baseball Academy brings 2,000 uh, Los Angeles area youth per year to play ball, study academics, and learn a vacation. And I look forward to the program's expansion into my neighboring district uh, in the right. center of Los Angeles. We call it South Central Los Angeles. And this is a very positive program, but illegal drugs in sports must be eradicated for the messages to truly sink in with our youth. And so I'd like to see some push behind the proliferation of such a program and the remaining time would you comment. Yes. And thank you so very much for your dedication and your work. Th thank you for your kind remarks. Uh, I wholeheartedly endorse your suggestion that such programs uh, uh, gain support and proliferate around the country. Uh, it is of critical importance. Reference was earlier made to uh, uh, Don Hooten, who's here. Uh, I met with him. Uh, I've listened to his message. He's gone through it painfully, as have other families who are here. Uh, I, I think it is a very serious problem, and it can't be solved solely by the professional leagues themselves. That's the point I tried to make earlier. This goes far beyond baseball or any one organized sport. It's a broad societal issue and will require a broad response at every level of society. And grassroots programs of the type you described at Compton are just what's needed all around the country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Mr. Sauter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have uh, 
a, a few questions that go to the fundamental question of whether baseball can in fact regulate itself. And uh, I want to uh, ask several of them if you can't get a full complete answer in, perhaps you could answer for the record so it's right. part of the I'll official record. I'll be happy record. to do that, Congressman. Uh, first I want to say that the one challenge is this uh, code of protection, this wall of silence that you were met by players was a horrific and terrible role model for Americans all over this country and kids because we could not prosecute any drug abuse in America if Americans followed the pattern that baseball players did. That drug abusers and drug dealers being protected in this way doesn't help the drug abuser and it harms potentially innocent people and calls into question really how you do collective bargaining when they wouldn't respond to you, they won't respond to Major League Baseball. I mean literally one either former or current player coming forth is a humiliation. If that were followed by other Americans, we would be in a disaster in our society. Now, a, cu a couple of things. You mentioned on page 309, just before you wind up, that there were other uh, trainers, Kurt, uh, Kirk Radomsky, Radomsky had uh, mentioned that. Uh, there were probably others uh, that came through. It's, it's pretty clear that the major breakthroughs came because of the Balco investigation. There was really no legal breakthrough. You didn't have a subpoena power. You didn't have the ability to grant immunity, which we usually work with in, in narcotics cases. Do you believe that we can actually find out, uh, because most of this stuff is two years old, not because it's, we have any proof that it's not ongoing, it's because that's when Balco investigations lost our, our key people. Can this be done without Justice Department and, and find out whether it's going currently or not currently if you don't have immunity and you don't have the ability to subpoena to find out even what's happening currently? Um, the, the second part of my question is, did you in the course of, uh, and this goes to, to management culpability, obviously the abuser's abuser, but did you look through emails and discussions uh, and, uh, uh, with the management to find out what they knew, whether they were discussing it, whether they had in fact some knowledge that they, they didn't come forth and uh, uh, because there wasn't really a lot of that, you, you allude to the fact that everybody was involved in this. But if, in fact, under pressure, management can't be trusted to make the decision, this becomes a huge challenge in, in how we go forward. Similarly with the trainers. The trainers, uh, it, it's clear from the, the statement about Radomsky, they are under the employment of the managers, not under the collective bargaining agreement of labor. Did any of them come forth? If they didn't come forth, why wasn't their management pushing them to come forth? I have heard from many sports writers in the first round and in this round who say they saw the stuff in the locker room, they know the trainers were there. Why wouldn't they talk? Because they weren't part of the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, we interviewed uh, over uh, approximately 700 witnesses. A very large number of them were employees of Major League Baseball clubs who were required to participate in interviews as a condition of their employment. Uh, and they included many of the persons in the categories uh, uh, that you described. Uh, as I note in my report, uh, quite a number of witnesses provided uh, a testimony that uh, uh, we judged to be not credible uh, in the sense that uh, many said, uh, I didn't know anything about steroids, I never saw anything, I never, this is the first discussion I've ever had involving it. But a large number came forward and we also talked uh, to a large number of former persons in the employment categories that you described. And so I, I think the comments made that the report is not exhaustive in the sense that it does not include every single person who used steroids, I, I don't think it's ever possible to get to that level. It does provide a substantial basis for describing the era as it exists. One final comment, uh, Congressman, on the issue of trainers and other medical personnel. I repeat what I said earlier. They are subject to certain legal and ethical constraints on what they can and cannot disclose about uh, persons whom they serve in that capacity. And that has to always be taken into account in trying to achieve the proper balance. D can that be done in any, because of HIPAA and all that type of thing, can that be done in any format other than the Department of Justice? Can, in fact, won't that come up in future baseball enforcement? Yes. Uh, it's very difficult to do in the absence of the power of compulsion. I, I prosecuted at the state level. I was the United States Attorney for Maine and a federal judge. 
and, I, and I've now been through this experience and I can tell you there's a huge difference between conducting an investigation when you can compel testimony and documents and when you have to simply ask for them. Huge difference. Thank you, Mr. Souter. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and the ranking member. Uh, thank you, Senator. And as an Irish American, I appreciate all your great work on Northern Ireland as well, although I find it difficult to accept the analogy to what we're, what we're doing here. Uh, let, let's go back to the, the previous point about the difficulty of an investigation without the, the ability to compel. You had very limited tools at your disposal, and still, I, I am quite impressed with the amount of information that you've, you've come up with here. Could I ask you, what, what percentage of, of your report or what portion of, of your report uh, would you consider the result of the, uh, the assistance given to you and your commission by uh, Mr. Radomski and Mr. McNamee? Uh, uh, we made no effort to categorize it in percentage terms on that basis. Well, let me put it the, the inverse then. Uh, how successful do you think you would have been without it? Uh, not as successful as we were with them. Okay. Uh, all right. Here's what I'm getting at. You, you conducted this as a voluntary investigation. From this side of the day, it's, it's, this is an investigation regarding the Controlled Substance Act, the Federal Controlled Substance Act. And, and you were compelled to conduct this investigation without, without tools, without the subpoena power, right. without the ability to plea bargain. And it seemed to me in reading the report that a lot of information came down, a lot of people were named as a result of what Mr. Radomski and what Mr. McNamee brought forward. Now, their testimony, unlike what you were trying to compel, uh, was not voluntary. They cooperated as part of their plea bargain agreement. And so the question, my first question to you is, how fruitful or how worthwhile do you think a further investigation might be conducted by uh, someone else, but, but with the aid of, of the ability to subpoena, uh, with the prospect of, of criminal charges, and with the ability to plea bargain? Uh, I respectfully uh, uh, do not agree that this was an investigation into the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, that was a necessary part of it, since many of the acts involved violated that law and other laws. But this was a private investigation conducted for a private entity, uh, Major League Baseball, in an effort uh, to first to respond to the request of the chairman of this committee and the committee as a whole, and secondly, to lay the foundation for policies to reduce or eliminate the use of such substances in the future. Uh, it, let me just say that it is the policy of the United States government and has been for many years not to prosecute individual users of some illegal substances, but to concentrate prosecutorial resources on manufacturers, distributors, and dealers. That's the case today. In the last few years, 250 professional baseball players have been publicly identified as having tested positive in drug tests and suspended, most of them in the minor leagues because that program has been going on longer, some in the major leagues. Not a single one has been prosecuted. Not a single one, even though the evidence was public and known. That's because we have pursued a policy in this country for decades that we ought to be concentrating on the distributors and the dealers. Now, if, if members of Congress believe that is a wrong policy, then it, of course it is within their power to pursue a change in that policy. But if you do that, you ha you'll go back to the arguments made 20, 30, 40 years ago when this policy was first initiated about how best to allocate scarce government and prosecutorial resources. Well, in, in yielding back my time, uh, Senator, I just want to say that I think there's a distinct difference between these individuals, these professional athletes represented by counsel that have agents that have uh, a lot of resources who are not unwittingly 
being induced to use these drugs, but are seeking them out for a decided advantage. This isn't some drug pusher going into a neighborhood preying on, on adolescents. These are, these are adults. These are people who have the resources, the skills, the ability to, to discern what is good for them and what is not good for them. And they are deciding to use these drugs at a decided advantage because there's a monetary incentive there, distinct monetary incentive for them to cheat. And, and that's, I'll, I'll yield back my time. Thank you, Senator. Thank, thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Senator, for all of your, your work on this. Thank you. Um, and I want to echo the comments of those who have gone before me on, on this panel that um, you know, the most important issue is how this reflects to our kids and how from this um, their views are formed of, of drug use. Uh, and using your analogy on Northern Ireland, uh, you indicated that um, you know, what we need to do in this is turn the page, get it behind us and, and, and go forward. But you also said that the Players Association was largely uncooperative. Uh, in, in order to turn the page, we have to at least have a, a, um, an agreement on shared values. And, uh, but yet you have a great optimism that that, that could be done. Could, could yes. you explain that to me? Yes. I did say the Players Association was largely cooperative in my investigation. I also said that in 2002, the Players Association reversed its longstanding policy of opposition to a mandatory random drug testing program and agreed to one, the program that exists today. That was a very significant step forward, and I think they ought to get credit for that, as well as uh, concern about the other aspect of it. I also pointed out that since 2002, the Players Association and the Commissioner and the clubs, on the other hand, have agreed to a number of steps to improve and strengthen the program, even though they were not obligated to take them up because the collective bargaining agreement had not expired. It, it, it's a policy of the United States to encourage collective bargaining agreements when employees are represented by unions and to ensure stability, economic stability, once an agreement is entered into, the parties are not obligated to take up any of the provisions until the agreement expires. Notwithstanding that, both sides have made significant changes, some of which, Congressman, came to light in the course of our investigation. As we would report it to them and ask them questions about it, they took steps to correct it on an ongoing basis. Well, thank you, Senator, because I, I do think that um, with all the work that has been done, and, and our, our chairman, our ranking member, need to be uh, congratulated, and of course for your work, uh, there, there does has to, to be some focus on the future and what, um, what changes are being made uh, so that um, you know, we do have an ability to have a different message to our kids. And um, I appreciate your work to help accomplish right. that. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much. Uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Uh, Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, before Thank you begin, Mr. Yarmouth, uh, Senator Mitchell, I know you'd hope to get out by 11. We have uh, five members, and there are some important issues that we still want, they, our, our colleagues want to cover. If you would give us another 20 minutes, I would That's appreciate fine. it. Yes, I will, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for your testimony and for your report. Um, although I must say, as the representative of Louisville, Kentucky, I'm disappointed the report didn't deal with the performance enhancing qualities of the Louisville Slugger. Uh, I'm sure you will take that up at a further time. You know, there's been a lot of publicity and speculation about bats in recent years, as yes. you know. Um, but I do want to focus on the issue of the, the concept of performance enhancing, because you mentioned in your, in your testimony, you say uh, um, the players apparently believe they took HGH because they apparently believe that it enhanced their ability to recover from injuries and, right. and to combat fatigue. And I think I'm focused as some of the other members are, Congressman Cummings and others, on the impact, the influence on the, our young people. And I'm sure that our young people are looking at this whole issue of performance enhancement and looking at Barry Bonds and some of the other players who have been named and saying, I can hit more home runs, I can throw faster pitches. And there's a, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the op-ed piece that <clears throat> was in the New York Times right after your report came out to a sociologist and a statistician analyzed all the players mentioned in your report and found out that there was no discernible statistical difference between their performance before and after they were identified as having taken um, these enhancement 
substances. And in fact, there was a slight drop off, if anything. So I'm, I'm wondering whether in the, in the course of your um, investigation, you felt that we really knew enough about what these uh, substances really did. Because in terms of providing education for our kids, if in fact there is no performance, I mean, in terms of batting average or uh, ERA or th those types of statistics, um, maybe the kids would be less prone to use them if we really found out that there wasn't any quantitative difference in their performance. Yeah. Would you comment on that, please? Uh, I believe that the subject is very complicated and as often happens in life, a phrase has entered into the universal vocabulary of our society, performance enhancing substances. If you look at and talk to the players who use them, you find that the motives, while they ultimately involve performance, don't always do so in an immediate sense. A lot of it is recovery time, recovery from injury, recovery from strenuous workouts, uh, the ability to work out more often, uh, uh, a lot of it is psychological. It made me feel good. Each of us is familiar with that effect. Uh, when you walk in to give a speech before 5,000 people at a convention, you, you know if you're feeling good, you're going to do, do a much better job than if you're not. There is a huge placebo effect all throughout American medicine, not just in terms of athletes or performance enhancing substances. So I think the subject is more complicated than a simple phrase represents. However, uh, I think there is also, on the other side, substantial evidence that in at least some individual cases, performance was enhanced as a consequence. It might have been psychological. It might have been recovery. Uh, I happen to think, having tried to play baseball myself as a young man, that anybody who makes it to the major leagues is a highly talented person. You have to be a great athlete to get to the major leagues in any event. So you don't, I don't think anybody who gets the big leagues needs a steroid or some other drug to be able to hit or throw or field a baseball. What they were looking for was a competitive advantage in a highly competitive situation. In my report, we quote one player who said, one of the biggest gripes is this other guy's taking steroids and he's taken my spot on the roster. And, and so it, I think it's more complicated than the phrase itself suggests. And as so often happens in life, the motives of the individuals who take them are not always identical. Indeed, some of them cite different reasons for taking different substances. Thank you, Senator. Right. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Yarmuth. Uh, Mr. McHugh? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, like all my colleagues, I deeply appreciate uh, Thank you. not just this work, but all the work you've done in an amazing career. Uh, in, in both your written as well as your presented testimony here today, you, you talked about, in your words, a truly independent administrator. I wonder if you could define for the record for that uh, what you mean by that, particularly with respect to the current uh, administrative approach by Major League Baseball. Right. Uh, currently, all of the professional, the major professional sports in the United States uh, uh, operate their programs in a way that retains significant authority in the league and the players association. For example, uh, in baseball, uh, the person who holds the title of independent program administrator may be dismissed at any time by either party for any reason or for no reason. Uh, that person does not have authority over important elements of the program. The testing regime, in season and off season, the, uh, the laboratories to be used to analyze the results, a, a range of issues. So while he has the title independent program administrator, I do not believe that he qualifies as independent as that term is understood in terms of best practices in, uh, in the field today. I, I cited a couple of examples, but I also said, and I believe this, that the test 
is not the form adopted or the words used to describe it. The test is the substance of the authority that the person actually has. And that's what the two parties, the Players Association and Major League Baseball, the clubs, have to decide on what to do. They're perfectly capable of devising an alternative method so long as it truly meets the test of independence. And I don't think you'll be able to answer that until you see which process they adopt. There are models now which exist outside of baseball which I cited. Thank you. But I would certainly agree with your observation that both uh, Major League Baseball and the Players Association have have come a long way and have acted uh, in a forward-leaning way to implement many of the provisions of your report. Have you had a chance to sit down with with Major League Baseball and the Players Association to talk about the remaining the remaining uh, provisions in your report? Uh, do you intend to do that if you have not? And and whether you have or have not, what, how do you view the likelihood of all of your recommendations being implemented in a timely manner? Uh, I've spoken uh, uh, by telephone twice with each with the commissioner and with Mr. Fear prior to today uh, and have talked with them and uh, uh, in both cases we agreed that we would talk in the future. I, I have to say that I'm torn. My work is completed and I'm trying hard to get back to other uh, things in my life so I, I don't want to appear here to be volunteering to continue this uh, my participation any longer, but I certainly will so do anything, uh, anything that I'm asked. My understanding is that they have begun discussions on the issues within their jurisdiction, and as I noted in my remarks, the commissioner has unilaterally adopted uh, the recommendations that I made, which he had the authority to act upon unilaterally. So you're optimistic that the entire report in due well, course it, will it, be implemented? It, it, this is not an easy issue. Uh, let's just look at the facts. There are 30 clubs. There are dozens of officials. Y you have constituents. The commissioner has constituents. There are 1,200 major league players. They're scattered all over the world. They won't be getting together uh, until sometime in February and March at spring training. Mr. Fair has constituents. So just as you go home on weekends and hold town meetings and consult with your constituents and try to get a sense of what they're feeling, uh, they've got to do it, what is, in, in essence, the same thing. And I think they ought to be given the opportunity to do that uh, uh, to, and then see what they can accomplish and then everybody, members of the committee, members of the public, members of the press, will have a chance to judge and evaluate what they've done. Thank you, Senator. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McHugh. Uh, Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you particularly for your rigorous follow-up on this issue. Um, we all appreciate what you've done, Senator Mitchell, and as I hinted to you before the hearing, uh, in your spare time, uh, Congress could undoubtedly use your services with a few disputes I could name. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that, that um, your report has come up before baseball returns to Washington this spring. Um, I want to ask you a question about the naming of names, which I think is one of the most uh, valuable parts of your report. And you named 90 players who you alleged used steroids uh, and uh, human growth uh, hormone. It's interesting to note that few have denied the allegation since. I'm going to ask you about one who has. Uh, and to their credit, some have come forward to say that they indeed were involved in, in such use. I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to the criticism, however, to the naming of players. Um, and some have alleged that you had too little corroboration uh, in doing so. Could you tell us what standard of evidence you used? in deciding when to name players and when not to name players? Were there some you did not name because you did not think that they had met whatever standard you were using? Right. I carefully reviewed and considered all of the information that we received about the purchase, the possession, or the use of performance-enhancing substances by Major League Baseball players. 
We received information from a wide variety of sources. And of course, in every instance, we attempted to establish the truthfulness of the information that we received uh, uh, before uh, anything was placed in our report. Since the Commissioner had made clear from the outset that he wanted this report to be public, uh, we obviously understood that our responsibility was to learn as much as we could and to make public that which we could in response to the mandate to accurately, fairly, and thoroughly uh, provide all the information possible. Now, uh, we received information from so many sources that it would take far more than time permits here in this limited time to deal with every single source of information. Some of it was documents, some of it was canceled checks, uh, mailing receipts, uh, admissions of, uh, uh, by persons, a, a, a significant number of persons admitted uh, the allegations uh, uh, over the course of time. Uh, some of it, as has been noted previously, came from the testimony of two men, Kirk Rodomsky and Brian McNamee. Well, let me ask you, Senator, because I think that th those are precisely the kinds of sources we would have expected you to use under the circumstances. But let me ask you about uh, the most controversial name in your report, perhaps, um, I'm sorry. Roger Clemens. Yeah. Um, Seven-time Cy Young Award winner, whom you, you say was a user of steroids and human growth um, hormone. Um, now we see Mr. Clemens coming out and strongly denying uh, these allegations and doing so publicly. Uh, why do you think he refused uh, your invitation to talk to you before the release of the report? Uh, I do not know why. Uh, as I stated earlier, Congresswoman Norton, uh, we followed the legal process which we were required to follow, and that is notification of then current players through the Players Association. Uh, as I described earlier, and I will not repeat so as not to take up all of your time, uh, the way well, it turned in fact, out, let, let, there were two, there were two letters he, that they went. Obviously had, he obviously hasn't told you and he hasn't told us. That's why I wondered. No. But could I ask you about Mr. Uh, McNamee, whom you relied, on whom you relied heavily yeah. for him and perhaps others. Why do you believe that Mr. Uh, McNamee was a credible witness and have you learned anything uh, since the report that would lead you to reassess your conclusions regarding this uh, credibility that you found uh, in Mr. Uh, McNamee's uh, well, uh, since, allegations. Since the report was issued, Andy Pettit has said that Mr. McNamee's statements about him were true. So they confirmed the testimony. And you uh, believed he was a credible you, re you believe he was credi credible on Roger Clemens, why? Well, let me describe the process. We made every effort to establish the truthfulness of his testimony. Through his attorney, he entered into a written agreement with the United States Attorney's Office for Northern California. That agreement provides that McNamee will cooperate with that office. No truthful statements can be used against him in any federal prosecution by that office. If, however, he should be untruthful in any statements made pursuant to that agreement, he may be charged with criminal violations, including making false statements, which is a felony. As part of his cooperation with the U.S. Attorney's Office and at its request, Mr. McNamee agreed to be interviewed by me and my staff and to provide truthful information. I interviewed him three times, once in person, twice by telephone, his personal lawyer participated in each of the interviews. Also participating were federal prosecutors and agents from the FBI and the Internal Revenue Service. I told him at the outset of each interview that I wanted nothing but the truth. No exaggeration, no minimizing, just tell the truth. Also on each occasion, Mr. McNamee was informed by the federal officials present that if he made any false statements during these interviews, 
he would subject himself to further criminal charges. Senator Mitchell, Thus, let, me, uh, let me. I just want to make one final statement. Thus, Mr. McNamee had an overwhelming incentive to tell the truth. And I've just finished, Mr. Chairman. The third and last interview was in early December 2007, just before we released the report. The purpose was to make absolutely certain that we had accurately understood and reported his statements to us. And to make certain that we'd achieved that objective, a senior member of my investigative staff read to him verbatim the portions of the report that were attributed to him. At the conclusion of the interview, as we had at the beginning, we reminded him that all we wanted was the truth. We asked him if he was completely comfortable with the truth and accuracy of the statements which would be included in the report. And he said that he was. He had a couple of minor suggestions which had no material effect on the report. And we proceeded on that basis. Thank, Thank you, you very Sam. much. And sir. as noted, I asked Mr. Clements to meet with me to give him an opportunity to respond to the allegations, and he declined. Thank you, Mr. Norton. Senator Mitchell, in other words, despite the public uh, presentation by Mr. Clemens that uh, the, the testimony was not accurate, you continue to uh, feel comfortable with uh, Mr. McNamee's credibility? We, we believe that the statements provided to us were truthful. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, if players using these drugs constitutes cheating, and owner and league officials knew about the use of these illegal drugs, as it is clear from the report, then it would appear for more than a, a decade, millions of baseball fans were subject to fraud. Fixed games played by drug users that uh, le illegitimately altered the outcome of the games. It's my opinion we're here in the middle of a criminal conspiracy that defrauded millions of baseball fans bil of billions of dollars over the past 15 years. If baseball is simply another form of entertainment, like going to a concert or attending a professor, uh, professional wrestling match, in which an audience attends solely for pleasure, and they do not attend under the presumption of some form of fair athletic competition, then there would be no difference between Barry Bonds and Britney Spears. But in fact, Major League Baseball is sold as a legitimate competition in which the outcome of the game is dedicated in a field of transparency in where every fan can watch it. The fact that league officials, owners, players, and, and players union all knew of the massive illegal drug abuse problem that existed and continues to exist with the use of human growth hormones. This demonstrates to me fraud to millions of baseball fans. Every fan who has bought a ticket to see the game for the past 20 years has been witness to a fraud. Baseball is sold as America's game, hometown, apple pie. But in fact, it appears that it has been rooted in uh, cheating for profit. The more home runs hit, the more fans in the seat, the more money in owners' pockets, and the bigger salaries for players. Major League Baseball is filled with lawbreakers and co-conspirators who ignore the problem and actively fuel the problem. In your report, you mention uh, two um, items which I'd like you to um, elaborate on. David uh, Secchi of Baltimore Orioles in September 24, 2004, uh, told his general manager, Jim Beatty, that he was going to go see a doctor in Florida to obtain human growth hormone. This information was related to the second general, uh, the, se the second Oriole general manager, Mike Flanagan. So two of the top Oriole executives knew about this drug use. And your report notes that no one in the Oriole's or organization reported this admission of use of growth hormone to the commissioner's office. You also discuss another incident, one surrounding Greg Anderson and Barry Bonds' personal trainer. The Giants trainer, Stan Conti, raised concerns about Anderson supplying players with steroids to the team's general manager, Brian Sabine. So my question to you is, what do these individuals do with this information? For example, did Brian Sabine take this information uh, and ask Mr. Uh, 
to have Mr. Anderson investigated. You spoke to the Giants owner. Uh, what did the Giants owner tell you about this? What did uh, Mr. Beatty or Mr. Flanagan give you any insight as to why they failed to report this very important information to the Commissioner? To your knowledge, has anyone else in the Orioles organization who knew about the use of human growth hormones, what have they done? And I thank you for your work on this because I want to get America's game back on track. Right. Uh, let me state as a general matter at the outset, Congresswoman, that uh, I, I very much share the concern that you expressed about the use of performance enhancing substance in baseball. but. I think we all have to recognize that this goes far beyond baseball and it goes far beyond the modern era. One of the things I did in preparation for this investigation was to read some of the history and you can go back to the original Olympics. Many thousands of years ago uh, uh, to find allegations of people in competitive sports using material to try to gain a competitive advantage. So I think we should be clear this is not unique to baseball. This is not unique to the modern era. This has existed for a very long time. You're all familiar with S the- Senator Mitchell, let me interrupt you because we're trying to help you get to your yes, train. Could you address the specific questions? Then yeah. we have one last yeah, question. I, uh, we don't have any more knowledge about the incident that you referred to other than we put what we knew into the report. And we have no information that any other Orioles official was aware of the allegations. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Mitchell, uh, I agree with the wisdom of your judgment to look forward, not look backwards. I also agree with your report that uh, the minority of players who used uh, these drugs uh, violated federal law and baseball policy and distorted the fairness of the game. Uh, the question I have is this. Do you believe that a Major League Baseball player who did use performance enhancing drugs and is the holder of a Major League Baseball record? most home runs, most batters struck out, most stolen bases should be stripped of that record? Uh, Congressman, I've done several of these investigations and uh, uh, in every instance I've been invited uh, to express opinions that go far beyond my mandate and far beyond my authority. And uh, I, therefore, I have adopted and pursue a policy of restraint. Uh, I answered the questions I was asked to answer in the report. It really is not my responsibility, nor do I have any special knowledge or insight that entitles me to my opinion to greater weight than yours or any other fan on the subject you expressed. That's the responsibility of other officials. That's where it should rest. And I think that I should limit myself to, this, to what I was asked to do, which I've done. Okay. Uh, just a few questions about the role of Major League Baseball itself. Right. Uh, according to your report, uh, at the 1998 winter meetings, Dr. Millman, Robert Millman, the medical director of Major League Baseball, gave a presentation that focused on the benefits, not the risk, right. of taking testosterone, right. uh, a steroid. Uh, can you elaborate on why uh, the medical director would be doing this, which appears to be completely in conflict with the policy? Uh, I'm not able to elaborate. We made repeated attempts by telephone, by certified mail and otherwise to contact Dr. Millman. He did not respond and uh, uh, therefore we were unable to ask him about that and some of the other information contained in the report. There were a couple of other incidents in, the report, in your report uh, of apparent uh, complacence by the uh, Major League Baseball. It's when the Florida Marlins were presented with steroids that were found in the locker of uh, Ricky Bones. Uh, that was not reported. In fact, the steroids were returned right. to him. Another case where the personal trainer of uh, Juan Gonzalez, as you know, a right. MVP, yeah. Uh, was caught by Canadian Customs uh, with syringes. Do you know what happened in that situation? Uh, what, what we found out, we put in the report. Beyond that, we don't have any information. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that, uh, as we described in the report, uh, the, the baseball policy requiring reporting of information was not widely known or understood and not widely followed okay. during the era described. Your, your report does 
they provide examples uh, of Major League Baseball having uh, what I think could be called a culture of silence, uh, the desire of teams to win games at all costs, uh, and the historic inability of the Commissioner's Office to take the problem seriously for longer than it should have. Uh, any comments on the role of Major League Baseball uh, in essentially through this action and inaction uh, aggravating what was already a very dangerous situation? Uh, I made my comments, uh, Congressman, in the report and in my opening statement, and, and I thought about those words and believe they best and most accurately and most fairly characterize the circumstance. Okay. I yield my time. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Welch. I, I do want to point out that uh, Mr. Davis has been sitting here a long time, and he, uh, I regret the fact that he's not going to be able to have time to ask any questions. Are you saying you're Go willing ahead. to have Go him ahead. ask Is this questions? the last one? This will be the last one. Yes. yes. Go ahead, Mr. Davis. Right. Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, I want to thank you for your continuing probe of, of these great issues of significance to the American people. Senator Mitchell, I want to commend you and your colleagues uh, for the tremendous work that you've done in preparing this report, and I certainly appreciate uh, your giving me these last opportunities. Um, it is my feeling that, that Major League Baseball has failed miserably in policing itself relative to the use of illegal drugs and the proliferation of perform performance enhancements substances by Major League Baseball players. The report that you have put together <coughs> implies certain things to me. Uh, my question is, do you think that the, the, the report suggests that Major League Baseball has the inability to actually police itself, or is it going to require further legal legislative action to get beyond the discussions and, and get beyond where right. we are to something actually being done that's right. going to stop the proliferation? I, I do not believe that the report leads to the conclusion that Major League Baseball is incapable of policing itself. To the contrary, I believe that what has happened in baseball is quite similar to what has happened in almost every other sport, including the Olympics. Uh, a slow start to recognize the problem, an ineffective beginning, but gradually uh, an effort increasing in intensity and effectiveness that I believe can be successful. I, I think it's very important that you don't take one sport and think that it's unique in that respect. You go back over the Olympics, you go over all the other sports, they've gone through the same process of trial and error, getting started, trying to figure out what to do. So I believe that in the past five years, with the, beginning with the adoption of the mandatory random drug testing program and continuing through a series of changes and improvements in that program in an effort to make it more effective. To the contrary, MLB and Players Association have demonstrated an ability to deal with the problem, not as effectively as I or you would like, not as effectively as they would like. And since the problem is dynamic, it's constantly changing. At this very moment, in various parts of the world, there are people trying to figure out ways to make new drugs that will enhance performance and not be detectable. You have to keep at it and you have to adopt the best program and you have to be flexible. I believe they can do it. I hope they will. Let me just ask, how cooperative would you say that the officials of, of Major League Baseball were doing your investigation and how cooperative were the Players Association? The commissioner was fully cooperative. The clubs were cooperative. The Players Association was largely uncooperative. Thank you.
Thank Senator you, Mitchell, Mr. you've been very generous with your time, and we very much appreciate Thank your, you. Thank your you, work and your presentation right. to us. Thank you. The committee is now going to take a 10 minute break before we uh, call forward our next panel. Former Senator George Mitchell ratchet, wrapping up about uh, two hours of testimony before the House Oversight Committee on the use of steroids in baseball. He authored the report, led the investigation. This, again, the first of two days of hearings on this issue. The next committee hearing is uh, scheduled for February 13th on the Mitchell Report, and the committee is supposed to hear from several players, including Roger Clemens and Andy Pettit. Again, George Mitchell wrapping up uh, two hours of of testimony. Well, it looks like we have about a 10-minute break in the committee, according to Mr. Waxman. And during this break, we're going to bring you the opening comments from Senator Mitchell. Runs about 15 minutes or so. We will show you as much as we can while this, uh, while this break continues. The Chairman, Congressman Davis, members of the committee, thank you for inviting